The views and opinions expressed on any programme are those of the producers and or the persons appearing on the programme and do not necessarily reflect the views and opinions of FRC Media, Bristol Community College or the City of Fall River. Hello everyone, um, and we are back for the second episode of Gaze of Our Lives. Today we're going to have, I have a very special guest who I'm going to let introduce herself in a minute. But as you know, my name is Sean Connell. Um, I am here for all of your LGBT purposes and needs as we talk about the gaze of our lives. So my guest today is Sarah, but I'm going to let her introduce herself. Oh boy. I'm Sarah Rodericks. I am the founder and owner of Balanced Learning Center in Fall River, where we provide um, mental health services, speech, language, and occupational therapy evaluations, in addition to a whole slew of group work, which includes working with our neurodivergent population and our LGBT populations. I love it. In fact, I'm actually wearing one of their shirts today. It looks so nice on you. Thank you. It is on the back, but you guys can't really see it, so I'm sorry. It's really there. <laughs> um, so yeah, so today I really want to kind of talk about education, what it means to be neurodiverse, and where those kind of two things come together. So, I could do this all day. <laughs> so we're going to have a great... But we're going to condense this into yeah, about 25 minutes. 25 minutes, and it's going to be all right. incredible. <laughs> so well, one of the things I want to talk about with education is, in, in your words, and we'll kind of go back and forth on this, what does it mean to be gender-affirming, to do gender-affirming care or gender-affirming education? Because I think there's a lot of fear around this. Gender-affirming education, What? well, let me back up. Gender-affirming practice in education is just going to look like allowing and validating people for who they truly are. So if a, I have three children and I have two boys and a girl, if my boy goes into school and he says, hi, my name is Christian and I want to be called Christian and not Chris, we affirm that, right? We validate that. It is the same thing if he came in and he said, you know, these are my pronouns. I prefer to use they, them pronouns. Or I prefer, I, I use this name because this really reflects who I am. It's sort of the same thing. So when we're talking about gender affirming practices, we are validating people for who they are, who they tell us mm -hmm. that they are. And then we're also providing representation in the materials that we use. Because, you know, there's a lot of fear around, oh no, we can't have materials that show two moms or two dads because that's going to confuse kids. But we've shown kids time and time again, a mom and a dad, mm -hmm. and we still have kids who are LGBT. So if that didn't confuse them, <laughs> then it's not going to confuse anybody. And if anything, it's going to make everybody's classroom experience much more rich, much more diverse, and much more um, open to the world around them. Yeah. Right? I, I think one of, one of the reasons why I wanted to, to choose this topic today, because I think um, some of the comments that I've gotten from my first episode around, ed uh, around education is understand that gender affirming care, especially practice in education, it's not lewd in and of itself. No. Not at all, right? It's not pornographic. Nope. It's not any of these things. Um, it's not forcing anything on anybody. Right? These are the kind of things that I kind of, I've heard a lot, and that's why I wanted to address it today. Because I think that what people kind of have missed about this is queer adults, we queer mm -hmm. adults, we were queer children, right? So, you know, if I, you know, like I said, I mean, I think I mentioned it in my, my first episode, I was called a faggot at six, mm -hmm. right? So people already kind of start to have an idea of what that means. And that was long before puberty, long before any kind of sexuality that I'd had, just because my gender identity yep. was feminine. I was very, I was a feminine, I had a high-pitched voice, I liked flowers and pink and girly things. That's what we're kind of talking about with gender-affirming things. It's, it's more about understanding who somebody is as they figure it out. And right? supporting them 
through that process. It is not taking someone and moving them into one direction or another. It's this is who you are, so I'm going to support that. And I, I loosely use that example of, you know, my son is 13 and he prefers to be called Christian, right? That is his name. And if anyone calls him Chris, he has a strong reaction to that because it's not his name. And so if we can conceptualize things like that, right? There's nothing no. abnormal about that. There's nothing scary about that. There's nothing, um, inappropriate about that, that's just his name. Then we need to be able to do that with kids who identify in in ways that maybe we didn't expect. And we didn't expect that because we were never educated in a gender affirming, neurodiversity affirming kind of way, yeah. right? We're taught to engage and expect things to be one way. Who decided that pink was for girls? Thank you because it wasn't until the early 1900s, right? Early 20th mm -hmm. century, that pink even was a girl color. Exactly. And so for me, with my experience growing up, right? Cause I've kind of, as I've talked about in my last episode, I've kind of landed on being non-binary mm -hmm. where there's the, the male and female is a spectrum, yep. but there's a lot of gray in between, right? It's not left or right, it's forward, mm -hmm. right? It's not right or wrong, it's empathy. Right, so there has to be these kind of distinguishes between these hard extremes because a lot of us fall in between those, right? And our gender identity, whether it's forced or not, is not it's not a fixed thing. It's something we develop over time, over time with cultural norms, with sociological norms, and a lot of this kind of we are going after the children thing. It's really hurtful to me in a lot of ways because professionally, I teach. Right, that's mm -hmm. what I I, I work with homeless youth, I work with LGBT youth, I work with kids who've dropped out of school, so I work with a lot of different youth in a lot of stages of their life. And if kids are old enough to know that there's a boy aisle at a toy store that's blue and black, right, and there's a girl aisle that's pink and purple, then they can start to have some of these conversations. And again, not in a lewd way. That's not what this is. Well, Gender <laughs> does not equal sex. sexual acts. Thank you. Right, yes. there's two different things. Two different categories. Two different things completely. And that's and that's really kind of one of the part I want to talk about because I think there's a lot of this fear in education that if we talk about it too much, then we're we're attacking kids. We are grooming kids. I've heard the no. word grooming. Yeah, no, and a that's a times. dangerous word to use. It's an extremely dangerous word to use. I have a huge problem with that because it's not grooming someone to let them know that you can explore who you are. Right. And when we are using language like that, what we're doing is we're setting kids up to not be able to tell what's appropriate and what's inappropriate, right? So you're using language like that. We use language like that to talk about pedophiles, right? And I know that that's the intent when people use that language, that we wanna to try to equate you know, gender differences with pedophilia. The two are nowhere near, even remotely close to each other, right? That's not a thing. But yet we do that and what we do is when we start talking with kids about what's private and what they what other people are allowed to see or touch and you know i always teach kids when um, we work with them around their their personal boundaries we always talk about like no one can touch what a bathing suit will cover right like very safe like yeah. commonplace way to do that but that skews the conversation when you start using that language to talk about very safe people in their lives you know their uncle their aunt their you know their cousin their sibling and here we are using that language and equating it with something so horrific harmful and traumatic how do you make that connection with our kids, right? That's the part that's unsafe. That's the part that's lewd, mm -hmm. right? You can't do that. I think for me, I always, that's exactly where, because people are like, oh, I'm not afraid of gay people, what's the homophobia, <laughs> but that is the fear of it. Yeah. It's that fear that there is this kind of insidious gay agenda that is trying to specifically go after kids and make them confused and not have them understand their own bodies. But kids become adults who have autonomy over their own bodies, right? And it happens quicker than- Sometimes. We, sometimes, <laughs> hopefully most of the time. We but talk about that's that. another conversation. That's a whole different that conversation, That is a very different friends. conversation for America right now. Um, but generally speaking, right, like your kids are going to become adults. And there's a difference between us going through phases, mm -hmm. right? 
where we figure it all out, right? I'm into my 30s, and it wasn't until, like, my late it's 20s. It's a long phase, You Charlie. know, it wasn't until my, like, late 20s that I really kind of rested on and understood what it meant to be non-binary, mm -hmm. right? That doesn't mean that I wasn't genderqueer or gender fluid yep. before that. It just meant that I was figuring out the best way that I could find the labels that worked for me, even though I'm not a fan of labels, and most of us aren't. But that's what society tells us we have to do, yep. right? Like, we have to have these boxes that we fit into. And so what are you? Like, what, yeah, what, what are what, you? What are you? Are you I don't get straight? it. Like, are you a boy or a girl? Like, it depends. Yep. Depends on the day, right? Like, you, one could argue that I am actually dressed in a much more masculine way than you are. Yeah, that's true. Right? I'm wearing jeans and a dark gray t-shirt. Mm -hmm. And I have bright pink hair and bright pink nails. Mm -hmm. A gorgeous leftover from prom last month um, and I had a stunning ball gown I looked amazing yes uh, <laughs> you are much more accessorized than I am yeah, you know I have my little you know my little earrings on and that doesn't make me any less of a man or woman no it just makes me who I am it makes you Sean it makes me a Sean right that's what that makes you exactly I do identify as a cisgender heterosexual woman right and there's no for me personally there's no fluidity there yep. right but we have a house full of children. We have a lot of, we have three of them. And- <laughs> They're fabulous. <laughs> a lot of kids, <laughs> right? And we have these, I'm married to a man and mm -hmm. been married to a man for 16 years. And we met at church, fun fact. Um, but we talk about these things all the time, mm -hmm. right? And guess what? All of my children are straight and cisgender. So we if anyone's kids were going to be swayed right it would probably be mine considering we literally have these conversations day in and day out not yeah. so much yeah same thing with me it right doesn't so work that way it's just not how that works like my father was catholic my mom was a baptist i had mm -hmm. three older siblings who were all heterosexual and cisgender and then there was me right mm -hmm. and so it wasn't any one thing it was just who i kind of grew into and who i developed as and the reason why I, I have this show, the reason why, why we do this work is not because I'm trying to force it on anybody. By all means, you can shut this off. It's not forcing on anybody. This is just a YouTube show, people. The idea here, though, is that if I had had some of these affirming things when I was younger, I would have saved myself a lot of the pain and agony yep. of not knowing that I was okay to be me. Right. Right, and that's what we're trying to do. We're not trying to make any straight kid into gay, we're trying to make sure these gay kids stay safe and alive. That's, that's what really what this is. We want our, our gay kids, our LGBT kids, to grow into safe, healthy LGBT adults. Yep. Right, that's all we that's, want. That's the, that's the game here. So, because one of the other things, I, um, we had our fabulous Fall River Pride Festival last mm -hmm. month. It was an incredible event. We had over a thousand people there. Which I could not be at, that's and I was right. very disappointed. Just no, it's Sorry. okay. Balance Learning Center was represented. We though. were you guys represented. Were there. I just couldn't personally. You guys be were there, there with um, one of your programs, Joni Place, yep. which we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, but the reason why I bring up Pride is because when we posted it on our Facebook page, um, and we had someone who took uh, photographs uh, mm -hmm. and put them on some of our local pages, and there were a lot of comments that it was, oh, this is a mental health convention, and all these people have mental health problems. And first of all, in any group of people, there's going to be people with mental health problems. Yep. That's just how that works, right? And second of all, what we're trying to do with Pride is help people who do have mental health problems and allow them to be who they are so they can, we can help assuage some of that, that feeling of not belonging, like we're an abomination. You know, there is a reason why the suicide rate in LGBT people so, is a lot higher so than normal. So let's talk about mental health issues and LGBTQ yes. populations because I go on my soapbox about this all Please. the time. So our Western society in, in the United States, we are one of the few cultures that when somebody has, or somebody presents with a mental health issue, anxiety, depression, right? Those are our most common. What we do is we look at the person and we say, how can we change you to conform to everything else around you so that way you no longer experience these issues? It doesn't work that way. That's not how mental health works. We are deeply ingrained in our environments and our environments shape our mental health. Just like our environments also shape our physical health, right? Like there's, there's a oh, piece yeah. to that. Yeah. If you are living in a home that is infested with black mold, you are going to be very sick. That's going to happen. 
If you are living in a space that is completely unaffirming and knocks you down every single chance it, it gets, guess what? You're going to have some serious mental health issues, right? And so what we wanna do is we want to pull together some protective factors, right? And that starts with building a community having safe spaces in the community, right? And people get very up in arms when we say safe spaces. Safe spaces doesn't mean that people come in and we coddle them. Safe spaces mean that people come in and they get what they need. That's what that means, right? It doesn't mean that people come in and we're like, oh no, it's okay. You can do whatever you want. It means that we're gonna hold people accountable for their behaviors, right? If their behaviors are harmful to other people, but we're gonna do it in a way that affirms who they are, that validates who they are. Yes, I just want to reiterate that quote there. Safe spaces is not about endlessly coddling no. someone. Safe spaces is about giving someone a place to breathe, mm -hmm. recollect themselves, and then have some support while they stand back up and while go back do. out there. And we look at it, right? And we we always look at because we we need to be introspective. We need to look at sometimes when we're in relationship and we're in communication with other people, mm -hmm. we have to look at what we do, right? Yeah. As part of our relationships, right? If I hurt you, then I need to own that, yeah. right? So that's part of it. And if I'm working with somebody who's trying to help me decompress from something else that I've experienced, it's they are also responsible for helping me see my accountability yes. in a piece there. But in this case, right, if people are talking about pride being this place where a mental health gathering, yeah, sure, we, I'm sure we have people with anxiety and depression because look at the environments that we're all living in. We are living in a state of repeated trauma. So of course we're going to have folks with mental health issues, but it's the LGBT part of someone is not the mental health issue. Exactly, because people need to understand when, why that can be particularly offensive to people in the, in the community is that we were labeled as a disease right. and a disorder Absolutely. for a really long time. Mm -hmm. I don't think it was lifted from being a disorder till the early 2000s. The DSM-4 finally removed it. Um, and I'd have to double check when that came out, but it, it wasn't all that long, long ago. Long time, right? You know, and there's been a lot of history. We're on the DSM-5 for yeah. those that okay, yeah. want to know. Right? So that's, so that's the whole thing is that there's a lot of history here of LGBT people, um, I always think of Alan Turing, mm -hmm. right, who was the father of modern computer science. He actually decrypted codes against the Nazis to help the Allies win World we War II. We were just talking about that in our house the other day. And and <laughs> what? how did the British government repay him was chemical castration, right. right? So just because he was LGBT, it was that or life in prison. Mm -hmm. Those were his options, even though he had just literally saved the war effort. And save the world. Save the but, world and know. founded modern computer science and technology, right? But he was an openly gay man in the 1950s, and that was not acceptable. Right. Right? So it's this whole being LGBT, it's not a trend. It's not, it didn't come out of nowhere. Right? LGBT people have had a place within history, within societies and cultures across the world for thousands of and years. And were accepted. And we're accepted, yes, for a very long time. Ancient cultures, like yep. we are talking about, you know, people people love to go back to what our roots are. Well, our roots are actually in yes. acceptance of LGBT communities, right? Of gender expansiveness in the expansiveness of sexual orientation, right? There, there was no binary before and we've created that, yep. right? This is a social construct. And again, people get really wrapped up about that. But this is a socially constructed situation that we yes. are in. This is not something that is just inherent in how human beings yes. operate. And I think there's, there has to be a broader understanding than eighth grade biology, mm -hmm. right? Because it's not just my body parts. It's not. Yeah. And my body parts, there's a lot of different ways our body parts can be arranged. Absolutely. Just naturally, let alone any sort of gender affirming mm -hmm. things I choose to do with my body later on in life. Again, not forcing children to do any of this. It's about allowing them to walk the path that lets them be their most authentic right. self. So in the last half of our, our program here, I kind of want to talk about some of the crosses here between being neurodivergent and being LGBT. And I have to my love know, language. you might be an expert on this. So tell I me a little bit about I'm this. I what definitely, is, tell me about this. It is sort of my love language though, right? I wouldn't say I'm an expert at all. So. There She's is a, a PhD candidate, so. There is a huge overlap between the um, LGBT community and the neurodivergent community. Mm -hmm. So when we're talking about neurodivergence, what we're talking about is any kind of atypical brain structure, brain functioning. 
typically that'll include diagnoses like autism, um, ADHD, and then there's a lot of discussion around like whether anxiety falls in under there and whether things like schizophrenia falls in. And I think we just don't know enough about what brain structures look like um, to really figure out like what exactly is that. But it's anything that you are born with, mm -hmm. right? That alters your brain structure. Mm -hmm. So having said all that, it's kind of no wonder that if you have someone who's got this expansiveness in their brain functioning, right? Because what we know about folks with um, that are autistic or that have ADHD, what we know is they actually have more neural pathways in their brain. So the highway has more lanes, right? And that's what causes a lot of those sensory integration issues. That's what causes sometimes that um, those like disconnects in communication, right? That's where you see mm -hmm. that stuff because it's like you've got all these lanes of highway. Mm -hmm. that are running more so than a typical person it's kind of no wonder that you see the same thing in terms of gender expansiveness or sexual orientation because if your brain is wired to see things in a much broader way then of course it makes sense that you're also experiencing that part of yourself in a much broader way mm -hmm. neurodivergent folks are seven times more likely to also identify as lgbt the non-neurodivergent folks or neurotypical folks. I feel like one of the reasons why I bring this stuff up is because there are a lot of links between being neurodivergent and being LGBT, but that doesn't mean, you know, because I had this one person who wanted to hit me with this study that said just all trans people are just hypersexualized autistic people. And they hit me with, and they linked that study like four times, and I linked like five other studies that were like, these are correlations, but doesn't always mean causation. And even if, even if for a minute I was like, okay, that is the case, why would you still hate on trans people anyway, right? It was kind of like, the, oh, the vaccines cause autism, so we are, no, we're not going to... No, they don't. No, they don't. They don't, to they be clear. They don't. But even so, clear. just to be clear, because even if I bought that argument, again, saying like buying this hypersexualization thing, even if I bought that, are you so afraid or so hateful towards autistic and neurodivergent people that you wouldn't want to affirm them or keep them safe? Right? I'm still and trying to wrap my, my brain there. around that. I, this, is, this is real life. This is why I want to bring it onto my TV show because there's experiences that I've had with this. I would love to see that alleged article. Um, I'll get it to you. But, you know, if we're talking about that, then I, obviously, like, we're not talking about hypersexuality because hypersexuality and trans people and drag performers are very different things, yep. right? Those are not the same. Um, but if we're thinking about drag performers and we're somehow linking that to autistic people, right? That's some of the correlation some of that, there? Yep. Okay, so if we're linking that, then I could argue that maybe we have more drag performers that are autistic because we also see a hyper creativity in autistic people yes. because of the broadness of how they see the world. Yep. And so we know that we do know, right, by default, drag performers are very creative, Yes. right? We are very artistic. We have a lot of skill sets in uh, more of the creative arts, right? Because mm -hmm. why else would you become a drag performer, right? Well, people would argue, because when we had Drag Queen Storytime over the last year, a lot of people was like, well, it was because they were sick and it was mental health issues, back to that whole circle, that, that we're going after kids with story time and all of these things. But drag as an art, first of all, has been it's around for a form. really long time. Right. You've been being entertained by drag performers since MASH. Like, there's, right, Mrs. Doubtfire, move on. Absolutely. You know, so yeah. there's, there's been performances in, in that creativity space for a really long time. And again, it's not about that mental illness. It's about that kind of art on display. Right. And letting kids understand that there's nothing wrong with difference. Right? It's one of the books that we read at the library talked about just all the different differences that there are. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you might know someone in a wheelchair, you might know someone with different colors, different accents, they speak different languages, they eat different foods, they dress different ways. And understanding yeah. that none of those are innately evil no. or bad, and that it's okay to be neurodivergent and understand and look at the world through different lenses. I think people really have to get back to the empathy there, as opposed to this knee-jerk reaction to the fear of difference. But we are not taught, and I know we only have a couple of minutes, but I, again, could go on and on about this. We can have several more episodes we about could do this a, we if could we do love this. this. For weeks. Um, but when we think about 
kids in school, mm -hmm. right? Typically, our disabled kids and our neurotypical kids, meaning just like the non-disabled or non-neurodivergent kids, are separated, right? They are not taught how to become friends with one another. Mm -hmm. And usually it's that communication piece that's a barrier, right? Mm -hmm. So we don't teach kids who maybe use, uh, we don't teach kids who use mouth words, right? That's how we kind of call that. We don't teach kids who use mouth words how to communicate with kids who use sign or who use um, communication devices, right? Or who use uh, a PEC system. Like we don't teach kids how to communicate. And so what happens is they stay separated. If we do a really good job about showing kids from the beginning that there are people that learn in all kinds of different ways and live in all kinds of different ways, then we don't have these issues later on, right? And we don't have to do yes. as much education as we need to now. Yes, and that's what part of my show I, I, I'm trying to do here is not just education, but I want people to understand that it's about integration. Yes. Right? That we are not trying to ask for special rights or special treatment because we're asking for accommodations. That's not the same thing. No. Right? If somebody needs an accommodation and you, and you don't do that, it almost seems mean. So, mm -hmm. for instance, if um, you went to someone's house and they want you to take their shoes off and you're just like, no, screw that. That's not special rights, right? They, no, that's... It's, it's an accommodation that you would make for somebody because that's their belief. They don't want their shoes right. in the house for whatever reason, cleanliness. Some religions do that. And so it's the same concept for people who are neurodivergent, who speak differently, mm -hmm. who understand differently, for LGBT people who express differently, who form families that are not the nuclear family, right? So I think people need to really get to this place where we can have these conversations and have the education about it. That's, that's really where... I think this conversation needs to continue to go. And where it can be safe yes. and open. And again, I got three kids. We talk about LGBT stuff all the yes. time. And they are all straight and cisgender. And I'm sure it's not never in a lewd way. No. It is in a, this is how people are. These are how people form families. It's mm -hmm. about love. And they can figure out the sexual education pieces when they're older as they right, get older. Because I'm not going to have that conversation with my yes. six-year-old. Absolutely so, not. Well, so speaking of, if you want to have some of those conversations, a little quick announcement here at the end. Um, I work at Recreation, and Recreation, I'm very excited to say, just got a grant to do LGBT Safe Spaces programming. So we're so going to be, exciting. I'm so excited about it. So we're going to be starting that kind of programming where we'll have mentoring, we'll have groups, we'll have um, socials, the whole concept of building community as a verb is what we're working on. So then with the trifecta of the programs over at 45 Rock Street at Recreation, we have the Balanced Learning Center and their fabulous program, Joni's Place. Recreation is now gonna be hosting the LGBT Safe Spaces and the Family Resource Center has the Affirming Task Force and a senior meeting group. Yes. So we are really trying to integrate LGBT people into the broader conversations, not for special rights, but for education, love, and a respect of diversity. Respect is what it comes down that's, to. That's literally what we're here for. And I think that's a beautiful way to end. So I want to thank you so much for being here. Anytime. Oh, it's going to happen again. I, I will do a, this all day. I have a feeling we're <laughs> going to get a lot of comments on a lot of the things hey. that we said. I'm okay with that. Um, so we can, we can always bring back this topic. Some other future topics we're looking at is a fun with flags. Because we, we flew at Pride all the different LGBT flags. So we can take a look into those. Mm -hmm. We're going to look into different people who are non-binary, trans, um, gender neutral, gender fluid, and have more conversations about what that looks like and what that experience is for us, for those of us who are within those families. So stay tuned. Thank you for tuning in, and we'll see you next time on Gaze of Our Lives. I made my day. <laughs>